this um, panel. Uh, these films have been shown in 10 different cities in the United States and Canada. And I think uh, we have uh, three other guests who will discuss aspects of uh, Guinea cinema. And then we can have a little Q&A, and hopefully you'll join us for a little reception we have. So that at the tail end of this fantastic program that was never attempted before in North America at this scale. So I think uh, we can begin with uh, Professor Sinanjidi from Georgetown to give you a bit of a political background of the times that Gune made his films. Thank you, Andrew. Um Well, I hope you feel uh, slightly more cheerful after this, um, <laughs> having watched a very difficult film as uh, the great director Ilmaz Gune was. So you should also enjoy the weather afterwards just to uh, pick up your mood. Um, but before then, um, I guess I should just say that I'm no expert on the filmography of Yilmaz Gune, but I was asked by Andrew to, um, to say a few words about the climate in, in the political climate in which uh, Gune existed and the times in which uh, Turks and the, and the Turkish state was going through um, and, the, and, the, and the fundamental political conditions that surrounded the country and, and, and especially minority citizens were going through at that time. And if you look at the conditions um, of that time, it is leading up to the worst coup d'etat that the Turkish state has ever experienced, um, propagated by the last um, junta leaders, which are now presently under arrest and facing trial. So that is the sort of background that you would want to sort of um, place yourselves in. And what you have to understand, between 1976 to 1980, fundamental institutions of the Turkish state had virtually failed and Turkey was on the brink of being classified by numerous in international institutions um, as a failed state. Um, all the fundamental police, military, well not the military, the police, the judiciary, the <coughs> law enforcement agencies, the teachers unions, these were all ideologically divided between um, extremes of the right and left political forces. And this was not something that began in 1976, but this was something that significantly increased after 1976, and where the state apparatus basically failed to um, control or come to terms with. But if you're really looking at where Turkey really went down the road to um, fundamental ideological polarization, it really does start with um, the early 1960s, uh, with the creation of the 1961 constitution, which is not to be blamed, but certainly helped facilitate the, um, the, the conditions under which extremist politics really did thrive. As the unity party or the unity government of 1971, 10 years down the line, the prime minister at that time, Nihat Irim, stated this constitution is too, too wide for us, too, too, uh, too generous for us which was to say that um, it provided too many freedoms for people and for associations and the expressions of, of any form of political ideology. And Turkey did, following the creation of the 1961 constitution, really open up to all the whims and winds of um, the far left and uh, far left political movements of the 1960s as experienced in many countries around the world, but immediately in its European neighborhood. And as a result, this, um, this did allow the rise of big labor movements, uh, student movements, fundamental divisions as, as, as a result of increased social mobility and the inability of the state and political parties to basically accommodate the increasing demands made upon the state by individualized and particularistic interests of uh, varying and nascent <coughs> ideological groups. And by the time the 1970s came about, um, what you had was the two main political parties in the country, which represented possibly over 90% of all electoral votes, not being able to form a coalition government, um, mainly because they lacked the seats, but none of them wanted to compromise and form a unity government, which would have prevented the decay of the fundamental state institutions. And instead, what you had was the governments that were formed, um, basically the balance of power or the, that was held by the smaller, more extremist parties. Uh, and these were the parties which basically managed the center-right 
majority party to stay in power. And this led them to turn a blind eye to um, very, very extremist uh, uh, political movements throughout the country. So I don't want to take too much more of your time. It's, it's a five minute sort of thing rant on my part. But I would be very much interested in if you have to have specific questions. It's a very tumultuous period, both political scientists, historians. I don't think it's been wrapped up. I don't think it's been, it, we've come to terms with it. It's so deep, it's so disaggregated that we could, you know, we could spend days and nights here talking about it from different perspectives. But nevertheless, the conditions under which uh, Yilmaz Gune was making these films was in, a, in times of extreme challenge um, presented upon individuals, filmmakers, um, especially with uh, leftist inclinations, um, because the left was the ultimate the political left was the ultimate scapegoat, the, 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 the political movement which was punished and effectively wiped out at the end of the last grand coup d'etat of 1980. Um, and as a result, even to this day, the Turkish political left is extremely weak. So I'll leave it at that. And, um, and okay, well, I think uh, the next speaker you hear is uh, another colleague of mine from Georgetown University. Uh, uh, Professor Asya is also, she's from the German department. And I'll let her introduce uh, what brings someone from the German department to a Gune discussion, which is basically the essence of her presentation. Thank you, Ergif, uh, for the invitation and for bringing all these movies here to DC. Make it possible that we can see the movies one more time. So, uh, two points maybe. First, uh, I think the BMW Center for German and European Studies wouldn't like it to hear that I'm from German department. But we do work uh, with German department, and uh, the second point is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I was asked to talk about issues of minority cinema, and then the link to Yilmaz Güney. I did some notes on this, and I'm actually mostly going to uh, read this because uh, it's going to be longer than five minutes, <laughs> and uh, that's why I think it's better to keep with the time. So, as I said, uh, first point will be uh, I, I, what I'm thinking of minority cinema, and I'm going to briefly state my ideas on this. As a second aspect of my talk, uh, taking the example of Yilmaz Güney, I would like to argue that filmmakers, minor, uh, filmmakers' minority consciousness is driven by their biographical experience and biographical knowledge as members of minority groups. In other words, and also from a sociological perspective, this specific form of knowledge based on bio, uh, biographical experience creates a form of realities which are central on their movies. When I speak of minority cinema, uh, I mean a specific perspective of cinema made by and about minorities, which focuses on and highlights minority perspectives. Furthermore, I mean a perspective that helps the public to unlearn stereotyped images about ethnic, religious, and political minorities and disempowered or stigmatized societal groups, such as the poor women, gays, transgender, transsexual, disabled people. My notion of minority cinema is based on the conviction that mass media intentionally or unintentionally teaches the public certain forms uh, of knowledge of and from majority perspectives about minorities which are relevant for own society. We can speak of of a manifest or hidden mass media curriculum that has a particularly powerful educational impact on people who have little or no direct contact with members of the groups being treated. So, coming to Yilmaz Güney's movies, Yilmaz Güney is an important symbolic of the realistic and political minority cinema in Turkey. He recognized cinema's power and influential aspects on people's lives soon after he began his career. Being a member of a powerless minority group, he used the cinema as an empowering instrument for his biography and in the following years for his political ideas. His biography and filmography are so interwoven that, as John Dündar, a well-known journalist, 
uh, in Turkey states in a documentary about Yilmaz Güney, he sometimes gave the impression as if he could not make a separation between real life and movie making. Yilmaz Güney was born as a child of an ethnic minority Zaza Kurdish family in the south of the east of Turkey. As he stated in an interview, he was a child of a family without property and road, meaning poor and without possibilities of mobility. He would soon learn as a child that both poverty and immobility affect not just his life, but also that of many people who share the same social and political environment. Furthermore, he would learn as a child to consider his gender as property in a traditional feudal and male-dominant environment. Later in his movies, he will use his manhood with a gun in hand as empowering aspects to fight against injustice and inequality. Injustice causing violence and resulting in crime are inseparable trilogy in his movies. We can give the example of Zavallar here, for example. In his movies, he always bring in the narrative that he respect the law, but life, uh, life circumstances and absence of a state force them to act as they do. So I can remind you of a scene in the film Out where he talks to a doctor. His movies show a shift from his populist attitude in his early movies to highlighting class consciousness and finally to considering issue of Kurdishness within Turkish national boundaries. The best example is the film Yol here. He focuses on con concerns of uh, the Kurdish people in the 16th and beginning of the 70s, dealing with problem of rural life in the southeast of Turkey. So southeast is a term, as uh, most of you might know, stands actually for uh, a region in Turkey where mostly the Kurdish people live. These movies center around issues of smuggler, smuggling, strip, uh, strip traditions, blood void, as well as its impact <coughs> on gender roles, peasants, and bandits in the mountains. In the second half of the 70s, he involves Kurdish and Kurdishness related issues in his movies in form of social inequality, injustice, oppression, deprivation of rights. And here we can take the movies out, say it out, or build again. In Turkey of 70s, most of, uh, maybe I'm going to leave actually this Yeshilcan part. Uh, uh, we can talk about it later on. So to come to the movie uh, Umut, uh, in an interview, Yilmaz Güney states uh, about movie, and he says, Umut is a mileage corner in my life and also in Turkish cinema. Umut, in fact, uh, Umut is in fact a movie of a rebellion, end of quotation. With his movie uh, Umut, Yilmaz Güney rebels against Yeshilcan cinema. Yeshilcan is a word for Turkish Hollywood, as uh, most of you know, and is uh, Yeshilcan's production. I mean with this stereotyped, degenerate, and decoupled from the ordinary people uh, movies uh, stereotype, degenerate, and decoupled from the ordinary people of Turkey. He considered his movie also as a rebellion to his own uncritical attitude in his former uh, movie making. With his next movie, Arkadaş, Yilmaz goes further than what he's trying to do in Umut, and he suggests a solution what you can do if you are in uh, in, in, in a political situation and don't know what the solution is. In, an, in another interview, Yilmaz Güney states uh, that he always felt his audience understood his political message. One of the people who not only understood Yilmaz Güney's movies, but also uh, takes him as a role model is a protagonist of new German and migrant minority cinema Fatih Akın. In his film, The Edge of Heaven, Fatih Akın brings together two symbolically significant actors for Turkey and for Germany. Hanna Shigula represents the films of the well-known German director, Rainer Werner Fassbinder, and Tunjel Kurtis, you have seen him in this movie in the role of Hassan, represent, uh, representative of Yilmaz Güney movies. This is a fusing of the social context which are significant to Akin's biography. 
So to sum up altogether, what I would like to tell you is filmmakers from minority groups have through their own experiences the advantage of having specific knowledge about historical, sociopolitical, and psychological realities of minority versus majority group relations. This privilege enables them to transfer realistic characteristics stronger in a narrative of cinema. Yilmaz Güney made movies of his life realities and found empowerment, and shared empowerment by movie making on the role overtake and the role overtaking. So thank you. Was the short version of what I actually have <laughs> planned for today. <laughs> well, actually, I think it's a small switch, and the third speaker will be Tom Wick, that uh, we were sort of together introduced Turkish films in many other programs, free or exactly galleries have done. And years ago, when I presented Hungry Wolves in Berlinale, I realized.